Was our forever DM wrong to use personal secrets against us in the D&D campaign? Cast of our story. Names will be changed, of course. Me, female playing a female elf ranger. John, our forever DM and our antagonist. Alice, another player who identifies as female. Also our female elf wizard. Tim, male playing a male dwarf barbarian. Liz, a trans girl playing a female human fighter. Bob, male playing a male dragonborn cleric. Prologue. Alice has been watching D&D videos and watching people play for a few years and wants to play. However, she has been too nervous to join a group. The rest of us were already a group, and we're going to be starting a new long-term campaign, so I finally convinced her to join us. I spoke to John beforehand and asked if he would mind limiting sexual things due to the fact that Alice was insecure about her identity. John said it wouldn't be a problem, and he wouldn't have any in the campaign, all homebrew, at all, and was glad Alice was joining the group. Alice was also quite shy around new people, so I made my character have a connection with Alice in her backstory, with permission of course, so I could attempt to help get her into roleplay. Beginning We begin the campaign, and at first everything is going well. Alice had started off quietly only speaking when asked for a role, or directly asked something, but after a few sessions she started to roleplay and join in. Fast forward 8 months, and around 30 sessions, and everything is going great. The only thing that was odd is it seemed that most of the loot seemed to be found by Alice and Liz. I thought nothing of it, as maybe John was giving Alice more loot to encourage her, since it was still her first campaign. The next session would be drastically different though. First signs of complications. The next session begins and everything seems okay at first, except John is clearly avoiding talking to Liz when possible. As the session continues, a thief apparently rolled incredibly highly and stole several of Liz's important items. All right, I thought, so we're going after a thief now. Side quests can be fun. However, when we tried to find out information about the thief or find clues, it was incredibly difficult even when we rolled well. When we eventually figured out where the thief was, it turns out there was a whole hideout full of thieves. They noticed me immediately despite an 18 to stealth when they had no reason to be on alert yet. The others came in immediately, and as combat began, they seemed to target Liz substantially more than everyone else even when she backed away and Tim ran forward to draw attention. It got to the point where Liz was behind even Alice, and yet most of them were running past the party to target Liz. Tim, our barbarian, asked John at this point why they were still targeting Liz, and John simply said, you'll have to figure that out. Spoiler, we never found out, even after Tim rolled a nat 20 on an intimidation check. Questioning two, we captured after the fight. Additionally, the four of the thieves died simply to run back to Liz's possessions, and destroy most of them, which was odd. First red flag? Liz continued to be targeted more than she probably should have been by most enemies for the next six sessions, so we adapted our combat to plan around it. During the seventh session after the thieves, we were exploring some ruins and got separated from each other, and immediately with only one roll, each Liz and Bob were captured by a pair of two giants, who were oddly working with a group of criminals. At this point, they started feeling up Liz and started taking off her clothes, we arrived and immediately had to engage in combat to try and prevent it from going any further, and yet one of the criminals continued to take her clothes off even while we were fighting his allies. We managed to kill some of them, rescue Liz and Bob and escape, but were almost immediately separated from only Liz again, by a passageway collapsing. At this point I was a bit annoyed with John because Alice was clearly getting uncomfortable, as the criminals who had somehow caught up captured her and continued with the surviving giant standing guard. Liz seemed quite annoyed by this as well obviously and was glaring at John. We ended up having to use a teleport scroll we had gotten to teleport her to us through a hole we made to see her through the rubble of the passageway. After this session I ended up having a talk with John and said that I would appreciate it if we avoided doing that like he had said he would, as well as asked why he would blatantly target Liz like that and do that to her. John replied, it wasn't targeted, it made sense given what was happening. I may have been having a few too many enemies target Liz in combat though, so I'll try to stop. I thought this is where it would end, but I could not have been more wrong. Second sign of complications. John is still targeting Liz in combat more, but nowhere near as much as he had been and nothing obscene. Now it's been five sessions since the ruins and John asked Liz to talk and stay after everyone else had left. The next session comes around and Liz says she can't make it last minute which is odd because normally Liz gives notice and we reschedule for some other time that week if someone is busy. John acted mostly normal for this session and the next, which Liz also missed before coming back. When Liz returned and was clearly pissed at John, 
but trying to hide it for a few sessions. But things continued on normally, and John stopped targeting her more than normal. The rest of us had no idea what had happened at this point. Second red flag. For quite some time, things were mostly normal. We went through over 20 sessions without incident, until I noticed one session Alice was being more shy again and role-playing less. I didn't think anything of it until I noticed the next three sessions. John asked Alice to stay later. By the third session, she clearly was speaking more quietly and avoiding looking at John when she had to respond to him. During this session, we were fighting a group of animals called Likards, which are basically scaled leopards with longer talons that can deal fire damage. All of a sudden, one of the three Likards runs straight past him and Liz, which is fair given they were engaged with one of the other Likards. However, they also run straight past me and choose to go for Alice. When the Likard makes a strike at her, it cuts her back, and John notes that it rips her clothes a bit. From that point, he states how her clothes begin to burn off, leaving her nude. I'm quite pissed at John now, as this clearly had Alice anxious and upset. Bob, also very annoyed at this, asks why it burned her clothes and not anyone else's. John then said it was a percentile chance that he rolled despite the fact he hadn't made an additional roll for it, only an attack and damage. After this session, Bob and I spoke to John about how this wasn't what we had agreed upon in our session zero, and that Alice had clearly been made upset by it, and the rest of us were very uncomfortable. Third red flag. The next session was fine and we got to level 9, important soon. However, the session after that got far worse. We were going through a mansion of a corrupt noble. We had gathered a substantial amount of intel, bribed four guards, and decided to split up, as I used Pass Without Trace to sneak most of the group into the main mansion, while Alice uses invisibility to enter the second smaller structure on the property. We explore the main mansion without running into any major issues, except for one maid whom we bribed. However, Alice on the other hand made her way to the second floor of the other structure and was grappled from behind, without a prior perception check, mind you. Upon this happening, her assailant pins her and places a bracelet on her wrist. When this is happening, we're investigating the outside of the mansion after looting a bit, and she's able to cast a message to Tim and call for help. We quickly rushed in and knocked out her assailant, who we later found out to be the noble's son. Bob uses a magic item he had to use to identify on the bracelet and finds out it's cursed. The curse is that whenever the creature wearing this bracelet takes damage, they have a chance to be charmed by that creature. We quickly interrogated the son when he woke up, who gave us tons of information, except regarding the cursed bracelet. Bob obviously attempted to cast Remove Curse to break the attunement, which was instant, mind you, and it failed for some reason. At this point, John was grinning and looked extremely pleased with himself, while Bob looked annoyed and asked why it didn't work. John replied, You don't know that yet. Bob, I cast Identify on it, though. Shouldn't I know how this works? John, it is a powerful curse, so Identify didn't give you all the information. At this point, most of us were annoyed except Tim, who simply said, Hey, no problem. Let's head back to the city. We can surely find someone to remove it there. We go back to the city, and while there is someone who can remove the curse, it costs one platinum coin. For reference in this world, two to three silver is enough for an average room for the night. We all together only had one platinum and a small bit of gold. We did end up spending the platinum to which Alice profusely apologized to us, both in and out of character for not being more careful and costing us all our money, to which we told her it wasn't her fault. Afterwards, several of us wanted to speak to John, but only Liz and Tim ended up being able to do so, as we didn't want Alice to be in there for it. They essentially told him he should know better and scolded him for it a bit. Note, by the way, Alice was invisible and hadn't been allowed a perception check to see someone obviously hiding near the top of some stairs. Crimson Flag. The next session, Alice is looking a bit uncomfortable at the start, but slowly eases back into normal roleplay throughout the first half of the session. An important note to remind you of is again we're at level 9 at this point. We had confirmed our sessions regarding the corrupt noble, who seemed like a self-insert for John, given his physical appearance was a near-perfect match, and had gone to confront him. I should also point out there that this was a side quest, not the BBEG or main plot. When we arrive, we tell him to surrender peacefully, and of course he chooses to fight after a bit of us attempting to negotiate his surrender. Our intel had indicated this noble was likely skilled with daggers in close-range combat, so Alice used Fly to try and cast spells from a safe distance. The corrupt noble on his turn, after barely taking any damage, also used Fly, and then cast Modify Memory at 9th level, and then he cast Feeble Mind. He cast three spells, one of which was an 8th level spell, and another at 9th level, which according to John's homebrew rules meant modify memory lasted the same duration as feeble mind, as it would be stupid for a ninth level spell to only last a minute, and that there was no limit on how much could be altered. We each took our turns, then the noble left, with Alice. 
Liz at this point started to say to John that he better not do anything messed up. And then John began to describe how he, not the NPC anymore, would tear her clothes off and lick her. Immediately, Bob and Liz started to tell John this was going too far. But Alice, who really, really, really hates conflict, and as you may have surmised is quite timid, told him it was fine despite being visibly upset. John then went on to describe multiple other vulgar things that he was doing to her, and Tim said he was done for the night and left. Then he began to describe how he basically forces himself onto her, at which point Alice is crying a little bit. At this point, Bob wraps an arm around her and hugs her and says, how about we take a break now? Go get some fresh air and come back in 15. I take Alice outside and she starts crying even more. Meanwhile, inside, Bob said, what the hell's your problem? And Liz says, you can't do this to her now. What none of us except Liz and John knew at the time was that John had asked Liz out and kept pestering her and even demanding she date him at one point, which is what had caused the earlier targeting in the campaign and such. Liz stated as much to Bob with John there. Bob, knowing Alice has a problem saying no, slammed John against the wall and asked if he had done anything to her. John wouldn't admit anything, and Bob and Liz grabbed my stuff, Alice's stuff, and their stuff, and we left for the night to Bob's house, where we called Tim and had him come over. We talked to Alice who cried a bit before she admitted that John had been forcibly hitting on her, and when Alice had politely said no to letting John, choked her and hit her. She hadn't said anything because John had told her, if you tell them they won't have a DM anymore, and you'll have ruined years of games for all of them. So she hadn't told any of us. He had been our DM for years, and had never displayed this kind of behavior, so we don't know why he changed like this. But we have decided to retcon the story to eliminate John's BS, and continue it on our own, as we never intend to play with him or even speak with him again. Alice is even more anxious and conscious about her identity now because of him, and it's unforgivable, and keep in mind this was also her first experience with D&D. Thus, the story of how we lost our awful forever DM concludes. Words cannot describe how awful John is. I would have walked out at the first red flag. Please don't put up with these monsters. Please share your DM red flag stories in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, All Things D&D. Stay tuned for more amazing Dungeons & Dragons content every day.